Ten years ago, I did a TED talk on Stuxnet, and I thought it might be interesting or at least entertaining to look back at that talk after such a long time. So, what did happen? How did that talk came come into being? Uh, very simple. About uh, a week or ten days before the conference, I got a call from Chris Anderson, the curator, uh, asking me if I wanted to present at uh, TED, uh, which back in the days was held in Long Beach, uh, south of Los Angeles. And uh, you, you might find that strange, but I have to confess I had no idea what TED was. <laughs> I had never heard of it. And uh, Chris Anderson must have thought, well, this guy <laughs> is living under a rock or something. Um, so he, he told me a little bit about the conference and Uh, you know, I, I just had a couple of reservations uh, because it has this entertainment in the acronym, etc. So uh, I just told Chris, you know, I'm going to check that out and I'll get back to you. <laughs> and then I asked my friend Dale Peterson, well, you know, this this TED thing, is, is this legitimate? <laughs> is this something that would be worthwhile doing? And um, as you can imagine, Dale told me right away, yes, 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 Ralph, that's the big one. <laughs> you should do this at all costs. Um, so I got back to Chris Anderson and told him, okay, I'm going to do it. And uh, But I still uh, didn't think uh, a lot about this or I didn't think very highly about this because I thought, well, you know, Chris was asking me for a 10-minute uh, talk. It was like a last-minute thing. And uh, I thought, I mean, why really go to Los Angeles, deliver a 10-minute talk and, and then go home? What, what would the impact be? And as it turned out, the impact was pretty huge in, <laughs> in my dimensions. Uh, so the talk so far got uh, 1.6 million views. And maybe what is uh, the most tangible um, impact of that. I have been approached by so many individuals in the years thereafter who told me verbatim, you know, Ralph, your TED talk was for me um, the reason to go into OT security. Uh, so that, that made this field so appealing that I thought uh, this might be a a good and fulfilling um, career um, path for me. And uh, so I don't regret going there. But my my, <laughs> my anticipation was, well, you know, the, the TED Talk. Uh, I just go there and hang out a couple of days at the beach <laughs> and then do my talk and go home. However, it uh, turned out a little bit different because when I was there in the conference, um, my talk was at the last day. And so I had uh, two days um, time just... Uh, listening to the other talks and, and I was like blown away um, because the um, level of um, sophistication or, or the, the, the presentation, the production value, etc. was much higher than anything I had seen before and, and that was for every single talk. <laughs> that um, suggested to me that I better do a little bit more preparation on my Uh, 10 minute talk, which I thought I could just deliver just like that. You know, I have I had already given a couple of talks, so I thought that that's not a big deal. And then it turned out into a huge deal. So rather than hanging out at the beach, enjoying the California sun, <laughs> I spent the next two days in my hotel room and rehearsing the talk. Uh, as it turned out, one of the big problems I was facing, that this is a total non-technical audience and uh, I thought, well, there is no point in talking about PLCs because they have no idea what that is. And I mean, you guys uh, know for certain that even the average IT person, even the, the, the IT security person has no clue what a, what a PLC is. So um, I had to rearrange the terminology, etc. And as you know from the talk, I'm just talking about these little gray boxes apparently that that resonated <laughs> a little bit with the audience so i was able to um, get my point across um and and just in case you are curious about that how the preparation goes for um a tab talk at least when when you are on site 
Um, in my case, I didn't have time for for much preparation beforehand because that was a last minute thing. And, and that's, by the way, the reason why I'm using so shitty PowerPoint slides. <laughs> I w would have liked to spend more time on the slides, but there was no time. But on site, you, um, you get a chance and, and you are encouraged to... Um, do a rehearsal on stage when the, when the room uh, the uh, is uh, fully empty, uh, but you are on the real stage uh, with the sound, with the lights, etc. And then uh, Chris Anderson does a a, a short uh, introduction for all the speakers, and uh, the message he um, presented was very striking in my opinion. So he told uh, the speakers, "So you know, don't don't worry about your talk. You will be fine. <laughs> you will get." your your point across so it's uh, it's uh, don't worry about uh, getting some phraseology wrong or something uh, because you are the expert in that field uh, so that won't happen however just be profound <laughs> and uh, certainly I, I thought that was a good motivational uh, short speech that he gave there because that uh, at the end of the day that is uh, is what it boils down to you want to uh, deliver a message that uh, really uh, has an impact well, one of the the major um pieces of information in my talk was that I, I nailed the target of Stuxnet. And this might be surprising for you because, you think, well, it's it's the Iranian nuclear program, right? So it's the, the centrifuge facility at Natanz. Ah, uh, yes, you know that today. <laughs> but back in the days, trust me, this was considered speculation. Isn't that interesting? Right? So I was uh, uh, leaning out of the window and uh, posited that this was about the uh, uranium enrichment facility in at Natanz, which was still disputed back in the day. So there were uh, a lot of people who had completely different ideas about uh, Stuxnet's target, um, which appear outright silly looking back from today and um, and uh, there were others uh, who said we may never know what the target is uh, and that certainly was total bullshit uh, we couldn't know what the target was and that was one of the main um, aspects of my talk to to tell the world which appeared to be my hypothesis, but I had some evidence I had to tell the world this is about the uranium enrichment facility at Natanz. And the, the two pieces of evidence I had back in the days was um, first the number 164, um, which uh, you cannot miss when you do the reverse engineering of the attack code. Uh, because it appears in uh, multiple data structures in the attack code. And then I had just learned a couple of weeks earlier <clears throat> that an Iranian IR-1 cascade is actually made up out of 164 centrifuges. Well, what a coincidence, isn't it? But it got better um, when doing my research, I came across a, a scientific paper by Alex Glazer. Uh, Alex uh, uh, is or was, I don't know if he still works there, a nuclear scientist at Princeton University. And Alex had gone through the trouble to calculate um, what the cascade shape of the IR-1 centrifuges would be or what it would look like. And um, this is one uh, piece of evidence I present in my TED talk um, with the diagram that is taken from Alex's uh, uh, scientific paper. And <clears throat> I compare this to a data structure that is in the attack code. And by the way, in the uh, attack code of the first version. So uh, once more, if you, if you still haven't understood this, the second and first version of Stuxnet are totally different. And if you only focus on the second version, you have no clue what Stuxnet is all about. So it's really worthwhile understanding the differences. So we had this piece of evidence from the attack code, from the reverse engineering, the, that data structure that was very, very similar to uh, the, the theoretical model that Alex Glazer had computed. 
And the similarities were so striking that it appeared, well, this cannot be coincidence. <laughs> it's something more. Now, the, the funny part is that uh, if you have followed my work, you will have seen that, that later, about a year later, in my talk at S4 um, 2012, I present the exact evidence, like the exact match. <laughs> now, and, and here is why that is funny. Because I am referring in my S4 talk to um, the to um, a picture from the official press tour in 2008 with Ahmadi Nejad looking at the computer screens, etc., at, at the SCADA screens, and then I um, demonstrate that you can see the exact cascade shape in those pictures from 2008. Now, why is that funny? Because those pictures existed already in uh, 2011 when, when I did my talk, my TED talk. And uh, certainly uh, also for the uh, nuclear engineers like Alex Glazer, they could have seen that rather than computing what the cascade shape might look like. Now, I, I don't want to put any blame on Alex because uh, he's, he's a very competent uh, scientist. It, 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 it just, um, it was hidden in plain sight, even for myself. It, it took me almost a year. I spent months looking at those damn pictures, only so much later to see, wait a second, maybe one could actually understand what the SCADA sh screen shows, okay? So, uh, until then, everybody was thinking, yeah, and you know, all these blinking dots, yeah, whatever that might be. And, uh, and then after a long time, I, I thought, well, could that be centrifuges, individual centrifuges? Mm -hmm. If that would be the case, one would imagine, or one would have to imagine, that um, the Iranian cascades uh, would be structured in rows of four, because that is what you see in the screens. And so, and, and again, now this is about a year later. I, I call up my uh, other buddy at Princeton, <laughs> Scott Kemp. Uh, they they used to work together, Alex Glazer and Scott Kemp. And I said, well, you know. I wonder if, if these cascades in Iran, if, if they're actually um, structured in, in rows by four. And, and, and uh, Scott, who has done a lot of research on the topic, said, yeah, that's, that's the case. That's true. I said, oh, wow, <laughs> then all makes sense. And this is how that um, later revelation came into being when I had the, the exact match. Okay, back to the TED talk. Um, that was one of the, the major points uh, that was like a, a new idea or new insight back in the days that this is actually, this is about the Natanz facility. And th the one thing that I really got wrong in my talk, and, and that might be uh, <laughs> of most interest for you in, uh, in respect to this video, is the outlook at the end. So I, I, I felt obliged to warn the general public about what I was afraid might be coming. And that is in, in the last minute or so of the talk, that is the, uh, the risk of cyber weapons of mass destruction, uh, which would uh, potentially strike industrialized nations with a high degree of automation, that was what I was really afraid of. I'm still, I wouldn't necessarily say afraid uh, today, but it is still a risk that's out there uh, because this can be explained in rather simple technical terms. If you take the uh, destructive sequences or something similar to what we have seen in Stuxnet, and turn that into a, a generic manipulation routine and deliver that as a, kind of like a worm, a computer worm. So um, you try to target or, or to, to infiltrate as many facilities as possible. It's no longer about a, a specific target. It's just random, okay? Because, for example, you are a terrorist you, or you, you just li like to see the word burn. Um, and then... <coughs> 
this is what you could do. And, and I tell you, you should not do that because I'm going after you. I'll be at your ass. Um, but this uh, would be feasible. So that uh, was the message I wanted to convey at the end of my talk. What I would see as the worst case scenario, um, it still uh, is feasible today. So what you would do is you, you take um, a similar payload for controllers, doesn't have to be Siemens, can okay, certainly also include other brands. I mean, we want, we want to be inclusive. Um, and that payload does a little else but brick uh, the uh, the PLC. And the interesting part here is, so if, if you want to be, if you want to write an, a non-specific attack routine, how would you create um, the most damage that you could possibly achieve? Well, first of all, you, you don't put the PLC in stop. That's just nonsense. That, that is what a rookie would do. The professional would make sure that the PLC keeps running. And the important thing is with all the outputs energized. And that means that the, the motors don't stop, the heaters uh, continue to heat and so forth, but in, a, in an endless loop. So mm, that is how you could, um, in, in the most simple manner, create uh, a lot of physical damage. And um, that is what I wanted to share. And, and if you're, if you have followed my work, you, you have seen probably that I have even specified, well, this would only take 14 bytes of code for a Siemens PLC. Back in the days, uh, I was considering to develop a full proof of concept with my guys in, in our lab because we, we felt they don't get it. They, they are, so the general public and also the, the specific public in the, uh, on the vendor side, uh, the OT security community, they don't understand still what we are talking about. Um, and we could demonstrate that. Um, so I was considering to develop a proof of concept, but I stopped the idea because I, I thought and I still think that this would be way too dangerous because it would actually work and um, it would be nasty. It, it would be a bloodbath and not in the, um, in the concrete sense of the word. So I, I wouldn't assume that this could also be used to compromise safety PLCs because we all know these safety PLCs are segregated in their own network and air-gapped and so forth. So nothing could happen there, right? Hong Kong, blink, blink. Um, Anyhow, so and then at the uh, end of uh, or after my talk, uh, Chris Anderson came on stage, which was totally unscripted. I, I had no idea that this was happening and asked me about my opinion, suggesting that this was an Israeli operation. Uh, and um, I, you, you can see me uh, pressured <laughs> under the, uh, the lights, etc. I, I had no desire to... Uh, go into any detail about who was behind the attack because uh, still today I, I don't think it's really super important as a defender it doesn't make a lot of difference who is uh, attacking you in this case successfully uh, the more important question is how do you defend how, how you, could you make sure that this won't happen again anyhow so uh, if you have seen the talk you know my answer well this this was a US operation with uh, Israel helping and that helping today, I would say, uh, I, I would phrase it differently. Well, Israel didn't help. Israel simply fucked up a perfectly silent cyber weapon. This is what they actually did. Okay. Uh, they, they turned this super cyber weapon into a prank, being uh, more um, interested in, in showing off their capability and, and certainly also throwing in a, a good portion of harassment against the Iranian <laughs> nuclear operators. Um, so, and so, and this leads me to what I uh, again got wrong in, in the big picture. If you um, just look back on those 10 years and and uh, you started out like myself with uh, thinking, oh, no, we are, we are all going to hell and uh, we are going to see cyber war. Um, 
fortunately, we haven't seen any. We haven't seen Cyber War. Isn't that a good thing? <laughs> It is not what I had anticipated. I had anticipated a lot of bad things ahead of us, uh, probably in a time frame of, of five years, but it didn't happen. And I think that's really worthwhile. After 10 years, it's really worthwhile to reconsider and, and readjust your opinions and, and your outlooks. Um, and this is what I have done already some time ago. So let's just take a, a quick look back. What, what really happened in the OT security space? Uh, what real attacks did we see? First of all, not much. Well, it's, uh, it's about a handful. And, and even if we include the attack attempts, there was uh, really nothing super serious with the uh, sole exception of the um, attack against Ukraine in 2015. But the irony, as it appears to me, is that uh, the bulk of the, the attacks and attack attempts that we have seen really uh, are more in the tra tradition of the second version of Stuxnet, which would be, well, it's, it's more like a prank. It's it's online harassment. It's trolling. Uh, isn't that funny? I mean, just uh, so go, going back to Stuxnet uh, the last time, you have this super silent first version that they could have used to just blow up all the cascades. Um, and uh, they decided not to. But they they could have been uh, they could have continued to do that for years without Iran uh, knowing what was going on. The second version totally different. Iran was aware of what was going on. They could not miss that what was at odds. It was that that it was about a manipulation of their roller speeds. So, so that was totally clear that that the um, the the mission objective. I will not say reversed, but but it, it made a 90 degree turn. It, it just turned totally away from the idea of a silent cyber weapon. It turned into uh, being a, a prank. And the interesting thing is what, what we have seen in the tradition of this um, cyber attack also has more the characteristics of a prank. Of trolling. So, let's look at our friends uh, uh, on the on the uh, red team side in Iran. Uh, consider the uh, 2015 uh, attack against the Bauman Dam. This uh, this piece of junk in upstate New York, which uh, was then picked up by the media and, and turned into um, something like a. a, a national security risk or whatever, totally blown out of proportion. Um, so that was a good example of another type of, of online harassment. Um, and especially if you look at the, the latest attack attempts, I would um, suspect by Iranian threat actors in Israel, where... where um, Apparently, a um, water facility was also uh, attacked and uh, infiltrated and manipulated. However, I'm still not sure if it was a real facility or if it was a honeypot. It's <laughs> really not clear to me. If you look at the uh, at the SCADA screen, which they, you know, the attackers were um, polite enough to do the video recording and uh, they have shared it <laughs> for everybody to see. And why shouldn't they? Because that's what it's all about. And that brings us to the core. So it's just another type of trolling. It's it's uh, showing off, well, you know, we can do that. And you are uh, morons. Uh, so you are helpless. You are defenseless. And, and we can infiltrate your critical infrastructure just like this and mess around with your water supply. Same thing, absolutely the same thing in Oldsmar, Florida, just a couple of weeks ago. It's the very same thing. You pick uh, random targets opportunistically. I would just uh, assume that Shodan play, plays a role here. <clears throat> you find a target that is 
totally uh, insecure, which is not so difficult to find, unfortunately, <clears throat> then you do your thing and you show off. You, you, you're, you're, you're proud of it. <clears throat> and um, that is, I think, what's going on here. What I was afraid of turning into um, a decade or, or an era of cyber war turned out to be something completely different, namely uh, just online harassment with other means. And I think the most interesting question today is, why is that the case? Why do we allow that to happen? Because here is, here is the, the, the point. Um, this cannot be done uh, just by those, let's just, stay with the Iranian threat actors, okay? So this also requires the victims, the helpless victims, uh, well, who just um, turned out to have no uh, no clue about OT security and, and apparently no desire to fix things that should have been fixed many years ago. I, I tell you one thing, honestly, if uh, if you have such a uh, a low security posture as you have seen in Ukraine or in Oldsmar, I mean, I can't help you. It, it's just, uh, it's uh, you are the one to blame. This should never have been possible. It, both attacks in Oldsmar and also in Ukraine could have been prevented by implementing basic, very, very basic cybersecurity controls that every consultant would point out if if you would actually bother to do a cyber risk assessment. So I, I you you have no sympathy, my friends. <laughs> In that case, the blame uh, uh, lies on you. So we we need uh, these folks who don't bother to actually. Um, get their security posture to where it should be um, in respect to the importance of the target, and certainly water supply is pretty uh, pretty important and significant. And then we have our friends in the media, and we have our friends uh, in the vendor space. And, and and here is where it gets really interesting. The um, the vendors and the media they just uh, try to fuel the fire you know they uh, they blow these things totally out of proportion as we have seen it especially with the 2015 bauman attack uh, and uh, also with the oldsmar attack they they um, tell you about well this well, florida could have been poisoned and <laughs> this is a national security issue and blah 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 certainly it, it was uh, totally different it was online harassment but they play their role and and now if you could even say if you look at the big picture this is just all theater well and, and don't get me wrong I, it, it will probably be good if it continues to be just theater rather than turning into the real thing but I cannot help uh, viewing it as a carefully choreographed theater, just like a kabuki theater. <laughs> where um, the the different actors, you know, here's here is what you, what you should take away from this. The term threat actor has a, a, has a, a new meaning. Because it's in, in these cases, like with the Iranian hackers, it's really more about acting, pretending to be a credible threat rather than anything else. Um, and the same certainly is true for the media and also for the vendors, the OT security vendors who, who pose as the, the saviors of civilization. I mean, ch come on, just uh, send all your money to these companies because otherwise you're going to lose civilization and, and how bad would that be? Um, and that all in a time when, when the real problems with critical infrastructure that we have seen uh, have totally um, um, different uh, causes. So, for example, in California, where, where they did have all those blackouts last year, uh, where they could experience what, what it is like to have no power for a day or two. Um, that had nothing to do with cyber. And nobody made a big deal out of that because people can cope with things like that, even though you might not 
like it. And certainly in the case of California, you might not like the, the incompetent utilities that are the root of the problem in that case. Anyhow, so, so that is my takeaway. Um, if, if I look back on all those 10 years, so how did the landscape change? And uh, so the good news is we, we didn't see cyber war. Big plus. The bad news is instead we got something else, which is cyber kabuki theater, where you have these nicely choreographed actors and, and sequences, dance sequences, you know. Um, I, I could already predict what is going to happen next when, when, when the next opportunistic attack happens, but you might be able to do that on your own. So uh, that is, uh, th those are my thoughts when I look back at that um, 10 minute talk 10 years ago, almost, uh, actually on this exact day, as I'm recording this 10 years ago, and, and how things have changed in a way that I uh, had never been able to predict. And, you know, that's what's interesting about that field. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the, the, this video. And if you're interested in uh, the other stuff that we are doing, check out our website at langner.com.